So welcome everyone to today's TAG talk by Dr. Robin Pender, who is here um, to talk to us for the next hour or so. And um, if it's okay, I'll hand over to you to introduce how and why you've ended up with this subject. Right, we'll go straight into it then. Let me just um, share my screen. And can you all see that? It's all good, yes. Excellent. Right, if you're all sitting comfortably, we'll begin. <laughs> right, it's really interesting for me to be speaking to you all this evening about a subject that's really close to my heart because I think it should be close to everyone's heart in the light of climate change, especially given the weird things that we're currently doing to the built environment, still constructing lots of problematic new buildings and then mucking about with buildings that were actually designed to cope without fossil fuels being thrown at them. And there are some strong messages therefore that we need to get out there because building history arguably has many of the solutions that we're in desperate need of. Now, I came into working on buildings in a rather roundabout way. I did start architecture at university, but it was at a time when it was considered to be uncreative to think of materiality or constructability. So we parted by mutual consent at the end of a semester. And I went off instead to study physics and then came over to London to the Courtauld Institute to join their new three-year postgraduate course in wall painting conservation. And that was all about preventative conservation as in, instead of trying to put bandages on problems that then did more damage. You needed to understand how things had got there in the first place. So the original materials and techniques and all the things that were done to them afterwards, but also all about the causes of deterioration and damage and the way wall paintings deteriorate is of course all about the building they're in and most importantly all about the environment they're in and the way the building works or doesn't work as an envelope and the things that people do in the internal environment to try and make it easier or more comfortable to do what they're wanting to do in that space. I immediately got involved in developing ways of monitoring and understanding that environment and I learned fast that it's all about history and what's been happening to that site over the years and why and I still think a timeline is the most important tool if you're working on real buildings. So I stayed on at the Courtauld to teach and do a PhD looking at the influence of air movement on the transfer of water through building walls. And eventually I was headhunted by the Bartlett in 2001 to do a scoping study commissioned by English Heritage that would look at the impacts of climate change on the historic environment. And then I moved on to English Heritage itself to the Building Conservation and Research Team, BCRT, late lamented, to be an advisor on building environments, but also to act as the chief sub-editor and layout person and bottle washer for the new editions of the Practical Building Conservation Handbooks, which they've been trying to update for at least 10 years. The original five books had grown to 10 and most of them were based on different building materials, plus one on a building system, roofing, and two fundamentals books on conservation policy and on building environments. And BCRT had been trying to bring together bits of information from themselves and from all the many brilliant outside experts who were their advisors. And the general idea was to concentrate not on repairs, which had been the focus of the original books, but on what caused things to go wrong in the first place. So this was right up my alley. But I really found myself in the deep end when faced with bits of text written by people who were such masters of their topics that they were assuming lots of knowledge on the part of the reader without realizing it. So I spent a lot of time reorganizing texts and adding inline comments along the lines of, but why? Where did this come from? Why was it done that way? And so eventually, purely because of my utter ignorance, we came up with a knacky notion that each of the books needed to begin with a history of the thing it was talking about. How was the material exploited in the earliest past? What changed over time? What influence did that have on what came next? And then we could go on to chapters looking at therefore what goes wrong and how to assess it and finally to say something about what to do about it. And now we guesstimate that this chapter added about four to five years to the project, but we all loved it. It taught even the experts just so much. It was really amazing because we just kept getting, you know, jaw dropping moment after jaw dropping moment. Oh, that's why they did it this way. And suddenly things that had seemed complicated or mysterious made 
absolute simple sense. And I was the lead writer for the building environment volume. And even there in my own special topic, it was only when I started to structure it as a history that it all began to make a much deeper sense. And especially it became pretty clear why the industrial revolution landed us in so many problems with climate change and not just in terms of emissions. But I don't want to jump the gun with that. First, I'd like to start us off on a bit of a journey through what we found materials wise and the link between building technology and in, uh, energy and what that meant for the way we build, the way we build now and the way we built in the past. So by default, I also became the lead editor for the metals and the glass and glazing volumes. And I also got very involved in trying to bring together what little we knew about the two other materials that characterize what we might call modern construction, terracotta and concrete. Now, I actually don't much like the use of the words modern and traditional, but we really don't have many terms available to describe buildings from the materials and systems point of view. And this was actually something we continually came up against as we were working on the books. Some ideas are intuitively easy to grasp, but when you try to define them in words, the whole thing just goes pear-shaped. So my fellow sub Tracy and I were trying to come up with a good first paragraph for the stone volume. And we thought we'd see if the dictionary definition get us started a good place to start so we grabbed the OED and we looked up stone and it said see rock so we turned to rock and I bet you can guess what it said it said sea stone and there was also a complicated second definition that rock was a conglomeration of minerals in which case you had to go off defining conglomeration and minerals and you got further and further away from defining something that we actually all understand there are often no words to describe exactly what we mean in building and construction, or we use one word for lots of different things, or we use a word that actually doesn't always mean what we think it does, and we end up in a real confusion. And we found that, that when, when we certainly found that out with the, with the poor indexer, when he tried to handle the word ventilation, it was, it, it was an object lesson. The issue is really important for architectural history and it's something that one of my African research colleagues has been working on, the loss of local dialect words you need to properly describe local building practice. So materiality is something that's really, really important. Buildings evolve not from textbooks, not from words, but from trying and handling and feeling and building and making mistakes and having successes and passing on all those learnings through proper apprenticeships. And with that in mind, if we go back to that materials timeline again, which we're doing a lot here, what it shows is that for most of human history, right back into the dimmest and most distant past, buildings were really made from a really small corpus of materials. And that only really started to change when we started to use fossil fuels to provide energy. We'll get back to that in more detail. But what I'd like you to think of now is just how expensive energy was in the past and how hard it was to experience exploit. It was mostly animal and human power with just a little bit of benefit from wind and water and from simple combustion. And that was no matter how rich or powerful you were, you had to use the minimum amount of energy to get the outcome you needed. Gathering winter fuel was no joke. Even King Wenceslas couldn't have had logs in his fireplace except perhaps for Yuletide. It wasn't Game of Thrones. The fires were tiny, small, and used mostly for cooking and lighting. The fireplaces themselves were big because they had to draw well. And you don't really start to get fireplaces in ordinary houses at all until amazingly late. This 17th century in England. We've really forgotten about all of this in our days when we have power and water just on tap, but it's made us very profligate and very much divorced from the costs of outcomes, especially the costs even further down the track, like climate change. Anyway, just like the page in the Christmas Carol found, transport was the biggest difficulty of all. So you used local materials almost exclusively. And when they weren't the best, say your local stone was a bit iffy or something, then you worked out ways to get the best from it, like rendering it. And actually, as far as we can tell, most buildings were rendered even when the stone was good. We have renders on diapered brickwork 
And that's probably because they didn't bother with repointing. Once those joints started to fail, they just started to render. And it was much easier and it was also more effective than our uh, things like repointing. Now, materials like lime were so useful that they were moved from place to place. But what we found everywhere, even in areas with lots of limestone, is that earth was the dominant building mortar. And that's right up until the 1930s. We used to say these were degraded core mortars, but they weren't. And even the cathedrals like Lincoln, the wall cores are earth with a little bit of quicklime aggregate to act as a stabilizer. And I think the quicklime they used for that must have been the rough stuff sieved out after they built a, uh, burnt a load of, of uh, limestone to make lime. Because the other thing we've recently come to realize is that they really did use hot mixing for pretty much everything, not slaked lime. It's much easier to make a workable mortar. The mortar's better. It has much less water. And remember, it was hard to get water too. You didn't have taps and hoses. And when you're working by hand, mixing together powders and then adding just enough water, it's just so much faster and easier. And when you look at the original text, this seems to fit much better with what they were saying than our old idea that they mixed from, from slaked lime putty. And it also fits better with the analysis of the old mortars. They're much more lime rich than anything we can make with a putty. Now, lime takes a bit of energy to make, but you could do it with the ordinary resources of a village. And if you are actually doing the bulk of the building work with earth and just using that lime mostly as a protective finish, that makes a lot of sense. Earth wasn't just a mortar, of course, it was used for rammed earth and cob as well. And the signs of this dominance are everywhere all those moats and village ponds, and they're still the best place to look for the right clay if you want to do repairs on these buildings. And watch more, you don't have to soak it, it's all ready for you to use. And you've got fish and you've got ducks and flood relief as a bonus. I don't think there were many one trick ponies in the past. When they did things, they liked to get a lot of bang for their buck. They wanted to get the most they could from everything they did. And what's sure and certain is that they couldn't afford to waste much, if anything. There are lots of ways of making an earth building, of course, and what was done in each place will have depended on the local materials and the local needs. But it's really interesting to note just how similar vernacular earth buildings are all over the world. Uh, it's a nice thing for climate change with the changing climate that they might keep working just as well as they always have. You probably know the good old adage that an earth building needs only a good pair of boots, good hat, and good coat. That's footings of masonry, wide eaved roofs, usually covered with thatch because thatch is nice and light and a lime wash. And that's what you see all over the place. And that leads me onto a little discussion into the science of how building envelopes work to stop the rain getting in, because that's something that's actually not very well understood these days. And the easiest is actually to begin at the other end of the timeline in the buildings that we're used to now, which are based on glass and metal and concrete and so on. What all these materials have in common is that they're waterproof, the water can't penetrate through them. Fred Masham Lee was the old head of the building uh, research station, christened these raincoat buildings. And they're actually pretty simple to understand. They're based on the idea of keeping the rainwater out just like a plastic mac or an oil skin. And that's absolutely one way of doing it, but it does have a few big disadvantages. First of all, what happens when the rain hits a wall made of one of these materials is that it runs down the surface and it collects into a flow and liquid water travels really quickly and it pulls in any other water it meets. And that's also why you get water being drawn through capillaries, which I'm sure you've heard about. And that's exactly what happens if all that flowing water hits a crack or a badly sealed joint. It can be wicked in through the waterproof layer really easily. And of course, it can't get out again once it's in there. That's one of the reasons cement renders are a really bad idea. Cement's not just a raincoat material. It's also brittle, and it tends to have lots of cracks. And the water running down the surface gets sucked in through those, and then it can't get back out again. So the wall behind gets wetter and wetter. And whenever you hear that a cob building has collapsed, you can pretty much bet that someone had rendered it in cement. 
And of course, it's not just cracks, all raincoats need joints and detailing those joints to keep them waterproof can be sheer murder, especially when you've got these multiple planes meeting and it's not helped by the fact that all the materials we're talking about here, the glass and the metal and the concrete, which by the way, are all materials that take a lot of energy and carbon to make. They also all have really strong thermal expansion and contraction, which means that walls made of cement need expansion joints, which is just another place for the water to get in if they're not perfectly sealed. And the problem with a system that depends on perfect sealing is that most often it's the really tiny cracks and punctures and interfaces and gaps that are the worst rather than the big holes, because those can act like a capillary siphon. I don't know if you can see here the water coming through in an otherwise brilliantly designed and engineered flood door. They were trying to seal just by pressing two smooth stainless steel surfaces together. But once you've got water finding a capillary path from the reservoir, we are out through the air through something like that it just keeps going it pulls more and more water through until there's nothing left in the reservoir and we saw that kind of problem with the first fibre cement tile roofs where they made those tiles perfectly flat because they thought that's what you wanted to do they could do that it's modern that was really nice flat neat but the water wicked up between them and they failed within weeks the old clay tiles were made with a double camber deliberately for a reason. People often assume it's because they couldn't make them flat, but actually they knew not to. And we know that that's why we build rain screen facades with multiple layers. That's to stop that rainwater getting right through the wall. But then you've got a maintenance and repair issue here. You can't see the rain handling system. So you don't know how it's actually behaving. And if you do get a problem, it's really hard to track it to its source or do anything about it to say the least. You could be coming in anywhere and ending up anywhere. The other problem with plastic max is going to feel horribly familiar to anyone who's ever worn one, especially in steamy weather. Once you get the water on the inside, it can't get it out and you can get dreadful problems, environmental problems of condensation. And so if you've got um, heavy building use or a plumbing leak or something on the inside of the building, so it doesn't even have to be rain coming through. Uh, or of course, if you've got any dodgy dealing, that that's that rain in, and that's awfully common since the current fashion is to have flat roofs and lots of horizontal ledges where the water can pull and funnel through. Again, your interfaces are a really common place to get, um, to get capillaries. I mentioned raincoat materials take lots of energy to make. So before fossil fuels started to be seriously exploited, they were all noticeable for their absence and all you really see along those lines is a few lead sheets for pipes and weatherings and a bit of hand wrought iron for brackets and nails and hinges. It's really a shock like with the fireplaces to realise how late window glass comes in, but I'll get back to that in a little while. First though, what did the early builders do instead of raincoats? Well, they looked at the problem in quite a different way and they went not for waterproofing, not for raincoats, but for greatcoats. And anyone who's been out in the rain in a greatcoat or perhaps something like an Andean poncho or even just a thick woolen jumper knows that this really works well. As long as it's dry to begin with, you can go out in a storm and it'll really protect you. You can touch the outside of what you're wearing and it'll feel really wet, but inside you'll still be toasty and dry. And the best thing is you won't be sweaty. So how does it actually work? Well, when you get a raindrop hitting a wall of brick and lime or earth or stone or timber or anything like that, it doesn't run down the surface. It's mostly held in the surface pore it's hit until it evaporates again. It can't get in any further. And that's the crucial point. It can't get in because the pores behind that pore it's trapped in are full of air. And that air pressure is pushing it back against the water. In a rainstorm, a great coat wall will just hold all the water that hits it. Nothing will run down. So even if you have some cracks, there's no flowing water to be sucked into them. The rain will only be drawn in to a wall if it just happens to hit a pore that's the mouth of a capillary that's already full of liquid water. And if the wall's in halfway good condition, that's only going to happen very, very rarely. And that's why it doesn't only work if you've, it, you know, this, this system, just, it, it, it fails really only if you've set something like a long-term gutter leak or something like that, that's soaked the wall so that hitting a liquid-filled capillary starts to become pretty likely. And that's why you don't, it's the same reason is you wouldn't expect your greatcoat to keep walking once you've um, fallen overboard in it. And all of that 
is why the detailing of older buildings is what it is. All those pitched roofs with wide eaves and hood mouldings and cornices, they're there to stop the rain getting into the weak points like the wall heads so that the walls stay dry. If it's too wet, the rain will be drawn in and making more and more liquid filled capillaries until your wall is really wet. But again, as long as your wall's in halfway decent condition, very little water is going to get in. And it really doesn't have to be perfect. In fact, having a few water filled capillaries is a good thing because that's how permeable walls buffer humidity. Now, there's got to be a tipping point somewhere where you know, you've got so much water that it pulls in more water when it rains. But where that is probably depends on all sorts of things, the materials, the construction, any voids, the weather. And it's not just rain that this system is very resilient to. We flood tested a nine inch solid wall of handmade brick and lime, which is thin by our standards. And it had absolutely no problem at all holding back nearly a full meters head of water for the whole eight hours of the experiment. And it didn't look anywhere close to failing when we finally had to shut everything down at the end of the day. Whereas by contrast, when we uh, uh, tested cavity walls, the water just went straight through as if the wall wasn't there. Actually, it built up in the cavity because it went through the brick faster, uh, the brick and cement faster than it went through the block work. So you had the interesting thing of a lower flood outside than within the wall. Best of all, with a great cloak building is you can, um, oh, and we know that this, this works, by the way, by, by comparing it to, to things we've seen in the field, we know that the solid walls are very resilient to flooding. Best of all, even if you really neglect a great coat building for a long time, you can rescue it and get back into good condition pretty quickly. So it's a really good and robust system, and it's even really easy to detail all those joints, not least because the materials like the lime and the earth mortar are plastic, even a bit elastic. So you don't need expansion joints in a solid lime masonry wall or a massive earth wall. So if we go back to that timeline again, what we see is for the longest time, we have great coat materials and constructions. Along with the earth and stone, the oldest materials are, of course, the timber and thatch and so on. And the soft curved forms of the timbers relate to the fact that the wood wasn't generally sawn. It was chosen to be about the right shape and then just trimmed or split to fit. And that makes it more resilient to uh, insect attack, by the way, as well as easier to work. And it's not just the big timbers we see, but the thinner materials like the cuttings from coppicing, systems like wattle and daub are pretty universal and must be really, really old. Actually, I've been wondering, I'll run this past you, if the oldest human technology isn't actually string. There isn't much you can do without string, if you think about it. Well, then eventually we get probably, as you get to bigger settlements, you get to those materials that take some serious energy to make, like brick, fired earth. The firing was in clamps and the bricks were very low fired by our standards, which these days it's assumed will make them less good. But in fact, in our flood testing, it was the low fired bricks that were the most resistant to taking up water. And we think that's because the higher the firing, the more the shrink shrinkage cracks you get and that produces those capillary paths that can take up water again. So now we have brick added to the corpus and somewhere along the line, lead and just a bit of iron. You know, as I said, iron makes fabulous wear resistant things like hinges. But until the industrial revolution, the furnaces and fuels weren't there to reach the temperatures you needed to melt and, uh, and cast iron. So iron hinges and nails and so on were produced very much using human energy in bloomeries where the smiths beat out the impurities and forced it into shape by sheer muscle power. And I guess that's why the iron elements you do find are so decorative. They were super high starter stuff and their form grew out of the way the iron was being made. The next material was glass and that starts incredibly late too. And we forget that because it's so ubiquitous now. So I want to take you on a whistle stop tour through the history of architectural glazing. We tend to forget this is really new building technology. It developed out of almost nothing in the ninth century, we think, but rushed ahead incredibly quickly once they started to make glass using coal.
So before you had window glass, for tens of thousands of years, windows were just holes in walls sealed off with wooden shutters like this wonderful Saxon example. The building envelope was there to protect you from the weather and the windows were really just poked in for ventilation. Light didn't come into it at all. And actually many Saxon buildings, as you know better than I did, didn't have any windows. Of course, everyone must have wished they had some sort of magical material that was both waterproof and transparent but for many years you couldn't do do anything more than use thin slices of horn or alabaster and even the Chinese who were just so brilliant at innovation never got further than oiled paper so why did it take so long to develop glass well, this is actually incredibly sophisticated technology. And if you look at it closely, it starts to become kind of amazing that they ever worked it out at all. So glass is just melted and recast silica and silica is all over the place because it's just sand. But if you want to soften silica to a viscosity you can work with, you have to heat it to more than 2000 degrees. And it's only with the highest power modern gas furnaces, furnaces that we can reach that sort of temperature. Glass making only started about 4000 BC when some incredible genius in the Middle East worked out that if you added sodium salts to sand, you could melt the mixture at about 1200 degrees, which they could just, just reach with charcoal kilns. And it probably all began with glazing property, pottery, trying to make that water resistant. You only got pure glass just for little things like beads. And it took another two and a half thousand years before the Egyptians started molding soft glass into little vials for perfume. And that you could actually blow glass to make a bottle, which is another thing we now just take for granted, it took another one and a half millennia to find out. It didn't happen until right up near the beginning of the first century AD in Phoenicia, we think. And if you consider it, it's not that surprising because blowing's not easy, especially if you don't have iron blowpipes and iron tools. You couldn't use bronze because it melts before the glass does. So you had to use ceramics. And so it was very difficult. Now, the Romans latched onto this new technology right away for making bottles and immediately got down to industrial production. And they did this so cleverly. Their glass making was all based in the Middle East where the sand and soda ash were best quality. And they cast their glass into these huge slabs, like the one in the middle there, and they break up the slabs and send the chunks all over the empire in people's backpacks so they could be remelted and blown into shape where they were needed. And of course, the remelting needs much less energy. The Romans did make a tiny amount of window glass by casting into thin slabs like the bit at the top right, which is from Herculaneum, but it wasn't very transparent and it was phenomenally expensive. To make thin flat glass at any scale, you have to use much more complex methods. We're not absolutely sure when or where the geniuses who worked it out lived, but it seems to have been somewhere in the Cologne Liege area around 800 or 900 AD. And they were almost certainly monks because the monasteries were the universities and research institutes of their time and they became the first factories too. And the most common method was cylinder glass where you blow a bubble, then you elongate that bubble by swinging it backwards and forwards, then you open out the end so you get a cylinder then you cut that cylinder down its length then you put it in another furnace and it flattens out to make a sheet there's another way of doing it that was clown glass and to make that you attach the bubble to a rod you cut off the blowpipe on the other side and then you spin the rod until that molten bubble suddenly pops out flat when they started to make windows for houses in England much later than this, crown glass was the popular choice, but it wasn't because it was better, it was because it was thinner and it weighed less therefore, and glass in England was taxed by weight. We do know that by the 11th century, the monasteries in that part of the world, Liège, uh, Cologne and so forth were famous for making gorgeous colored glass for cathedrals and palaces and that technology spread throughout Europe, um, sticking these little pieces of glass together with lead. This was still a period when you had masons and other practical people who could learn from their mistakes. And they pretty quickly worked out that if you put glass in a window, the rain hitting it is going to collect and run down the glass. It's a rain coat and it's therefore going to get in the wall. But they developed all sorts of clever architectural details to cut how much rain reached the window and stop it getting into the fabric. So things like hood mouldings and cornices and slope sills with drips cut underneath. In other words, all those details that characterize Gothic architecture 
they're there for a really practical reason. The energy that they needed to make this glass was phenomenal. To get a, a sugar bag's worth of glass takes the energy that's in a whole beech tree, full grown beech tree. It had to come from wood or charcoal and they used up whole countrysides of forest doing it. The glass makers got chased around the place by everyone saying leave our forests alone. Uh, so at first all that energy came from charcoal and that meant finding the right wood and coppicing and burning it in the right way. And so that all was extremely expensive. So for quite a few centuries, glass windows were something only for the richest churches and only a very, very few palaces. And everyone else kept on with wooden shutters. And actually you could find the signs of shutters being used on stained glass, especially in the cold north. I've seen shutter pintles in Carlisle. You don't start to see glass in ordinary-ish houses until the late 16th century. And this was really, really conspicuous consumption. It was about the most expensive thing you could own. And the windows were little iron framed casements and the rich took them off the pintles, took them from house to house as they moved around. And they were even separately valued to the house for probate. But once people worked out how to use coal for fuel, which is a lot easier for glass than it is for iron, glass making became a lot easier and a lot cheaper, especially in England, which had lots of shallow coal supplies that were easy to mine. I would think that glass was the first truly industrial material. Really quickly, glass windows went from being small and rare to more and more common and bigger and bigger. And the glass got clearer and could itself be made in bigger and bigger pieces. And as the glass got bigger, the windows really began to be about letting light in. And the biggest market for that was probably the shopkeepers because this was well before electric lights. And if you think about it, all the other artificial light sources just make masses of soot and smoke and grease, which you don't want getting on goods. And there's security too. You don't want to just leave everything open to the air and the weather and light fingers, but you still want customers to see what you've got. So it's for the shopping arcades that you start to see the first skylights and the first really large windows. The textile mills were also really interested in glass in roofs and like here at Temple Mill uh, in Leeds where the roof was grass to keep the humidity high enough to spin the flax and they actually kept sheep up there to trim the grass until one of them is meant to have fallen through one of those skylights and killed some poor mill worker underneath. And I also think, but this is me guessing a bit, but I think that glass windows must have been the key technology for terrace houses, because in the days before artificial lighting, you needed windows to be really large if you had only two wall, uh, walls back and front, and you certainly needed those windows if you had stairs. You also needed for these houses really good cross ventilation. I bet that's the thing that drove the other technological leap, which happened sometime in the 17th century in either Holland or England, we're not sure which. And of course, it's the invention of the wonderful vertically sliding sash window, which is really brilliant technology. It gives you pretty much pinpoint perfect control over ventilation, both at person height and at ceiling height. Knocks trickle vents into a cocked hat. It won't get blocked up by dirt. And unlike a casement, you don't risk the window slamming shut in the wind and breaking all that expensive glass and you could leave your windows open at night at the top for night flushing letting out all the hot air that's gathered at the uh, ceiling uh, during the day and letting in the cool uh, night air to take its place but at the same time you could shut your shutters uh, for security and warmth and privacy because the win window is in a single plane by this stage, they're making window frames from wood rather than metal, and they used oak a lot and Baltic pine, but whatever the type of wood, hardwood or softwood, it was all old growth heartwood, so it was really resistant to rot and insect attack. It's got a pretty indefinite lifespan if you look after it. Unlike modern fast grown plantation timber, which my expert colleague Brian Riddart goes, says goes by the technical term of kindling, Wood also had one super huge advantage over metal and that became more and more useful and important as the glass pieces got bigger. Wood doesn't have much thermal expansion and contraction of its own, unlike the glass and the metal. And that thermal expansion is really tricky because windows get sun warmed and air cooled all the time. So if everything's moving about manly, it's really hard to keep it from buckling or sticking or else being too small and letting the air through and in drafts. So timbers are real improvement to metal here. They used elastic linseed oil putties to seal the joint between the glass and the frame, and which is really the weak point because if water gets into there it can be trapped and that will rot even heartwood. 
And this is a particular problem now that we clean our windows using lots of water, which wasn't done in the past, and which is not actually the safest thing to do. A lot of the times the frames were just left unpainted and the most common paint if you did paint was lead based and very permeable. And we're seeing the problems now that come from using plastic paints that can trap moisture. And I suspect the real purpose of those old paints wasn't so much to cover the surfaces, but just to seal the joints and to protect the putty from cracking. Now, of course, cleaning's a chore they didn't have before glass. And as the windows got bigger and bigger, they began to find out some other disadvantages as well. Heat loss and drafts coming through the frame or down from the air cooled in front of the window on the interior. And really, really importantly, glare and overheating from sunlight, which can be a problem even in winter because glass transfers solar energy really easily. So all that light too wasn't great for furniture and fittings, but they had this feedback system still. So they worked out pretty quickly how to deal with things like that. For heat loss, they kept using shutters and they added curtains and blinds to cover the windows at night. And the blinds and curtains were also a help for cutting the solar glare and the light transmission, but they came up with something much better still for that, which is awnings. Now, these seem to have been completely standard additions right through the UK from the early 19th, 18th century onwards until everyone got rid of them in a sort of modernist fervour after the Second World War, along with a lot of the watershedding detailing. And I do find that bonkers. But I come from Australia where we still use awnings and my parents are Dutch and they use awnings all over the place there too. You get a lot of your bang for your buck with an awning. They protect the window from the weather. And in summer, you can leave your sliding sash open, even if it's raining, without getting the water in the building. So getting back to the history, once the price of glass dropped, people could start to look at secondary glazing. And it's no surprise that it's not in the UK with its milder climate, but in the colder climates that they really led on this one. You see really good early secondary windows in Germany and Russia. By now, back in England, we're right in the throes of the Industrial Revolution. So we've got Bessemer converters letting us use coal to make iron, to make diggers and steam hammers to get more iron, to make more Bessemer converters and trains and ships and transport everything around and so on and so on. And there we were on the technology roller coaster that hasn't slowed since. And the Victorians were innovators and they tried out everything with their new materials. They invented some really good practical things like those very clever awnings. A lot of them improved ventilation as well. But they also went down some rabbit holes and some of those we're still trying to find our way out of now. And the worst of these has to surely be building whole envelopes out of glass with results for comfort that are terribly familiar to us all as we slowly poach or blink at the screens in our super glazed office buildings. By this stage, though, everything was moving so quickly that builders weren't any longer so good at learning from their mistakes. Mind you, there were still wonderful things happening like Strawberry Hill and Horace Walpole was a man who believed in comfort and a single window, they might have lots of things, a wind, an awning, secondary uh, sliding, gla uh, sliding secondary glazing, which got out of the way in summer, sometimes of stained glass. So it looked beautiful too. Sliding wooden shutters, blinds, curtains. And that meant he could fine tune his environment according to the weather and how he and his guests felt. And it's to that interior environment I want to turn now to work towards finishing this long tail, because in some ways this is the most important story of all, and it's the most forgotten. Now, we're all familiar with these lovely images of interiors in medieval illuminations and other paintings, but if you're like me, you'll have spent many, many years looking at these without really registering what they're telling us, because they almost all show something really important that we overlook or see as just being decoration. And it's all those cloths on the walls and the canopies. Like the watershedding Gothic window detailing, the textiles looked beautiful, but that really wasn't why they were there. If we take another quick sideways dip into science, we can see where they were performing a really important service that we've just forgotten about. When we think now of dealing with thermal discomfort, we tend to think of heating or cooling the air, but that's not what's happening here. Look what's on the wall behind Tobit. Or how about this image, which the artist actually called poverty. No fireplace there, empty or otherwise, but there are holes in the walls and there's a cloth and canopy that also has holes. 
these days, if we want to figure out whether we feel comfortable or not, we go and have a look at the thermostat. But the thermometer wasn't invented until the 18th century and not having it wasn't actually a problem. As we can see, if we look at the issue of thermal comfort through the eyes of the thermal physiologists, and they point out that we're warm blooded creatures, we're the heat source in a room. We need to keep our core temperature at a very steady 37 degrees, plus or minus two degrees, whatever we're doing or our organs fail. And to do that, we have all sorts of physiological mechanisms, mostly based on our skin, but not all. So if your hands and feet start to feel cold, it's because your body's cutting the flow of blood to them so that the blood isn't cooled too much for the heart and brain. If we get too hot, the body pumps blood into the skin and we sweat so that some of that heat can be lost from the blood by evaporation. And that's the main way we lose heat into the air. If your skin's wet and there's a stiff breeze, then as much as 22% of your heat loss will be going into the air. But it's right at the bottom of that range for a person indoors. We also lose heat by direct contact, often through our feet into the floor. But how much that is depends on the materials and contact area. Generally, it's not that much. But the way we lose most of our body heat far and away isn't by conduction, but by us radiating it into the surfaces around us. And most physiologists put that at around 60 to 65 percent heat loss or going up from there, depending on what you're wearing. Uh, it can go up much higher. I've seen 85 percent in some cases as quoted not necessarily a negative because even in the cold, we do need to lose some heat if we're not going to die of overheating. And in hot weather or when we're active, it helps to keep us comfortable. And that's why in summer, it's so lovely going into a stone church and sitting near the wall, but in winter, it makes us feel so very, very cold. Basically, we're just trying to heat up the massive stone wall with our little warm blooded bodies. And unlike the government seems to think with its insulation program, it's not going through the wall, it's just heating up the wall a little bit it's cooling you down a lot. All measurements are proxies for what we want to know. And the sad truth is the things that are easy to measure are very, very rarely the important things. They couldn't measure air temperature before the invention of the thermometer, but nobody really cared because it wasn't important for how they made themselves comfortable. And even if we've forgotten a lot about this, at least in the rich global north, where we've got used to throwing fossil fuel at every problem, we do still know we can be comfortable in very low or very high air temperatures and very uncomfortable in perfectly reasonable ones. The air temperature doesn't actually tell us that much. Because we feel uncomfortable in winter now in massive buildings, we tend to assume that they were all really cold in the past. But that's not at all what the art and the literature of the time is telling us. We have to remember that these buildings have been stripped bare. There were originally war cloths and canopies everywhere, all over the world. Tapestries if you were uber rich, or cloth and hides for everyone else. And they're slashing that 60 to 65% of heat loss. They don't even need to be heavy. Even a thin cloth can make a terrific radiant break, like here in the Shaker village where they're hanging it from the peg rails. In Flanders, they like leather. In the UK, it was generally painted cloth stretched onto battens on the walls. They made cloths into draft screens and they hung them across the doors and they put rush mats on the floor for the same reason. And this was poor as well as rich and church as well as secular. In the churches, the, the, which were of course the first buildings to have really serious glass windows, to deal with the drafts they got from that interior air being chilled by touching the glass and then falling, they hung their wall cloths right across the base of the windows to catch that air as it fell. So no wonder the medieval windows had such steep internal sills, which always used to puzzle me. There are just thousands and thousands of these images and we can still see lots of old hooks everywhere and there are clues in the fictive draperies everywhere too because in lots of cases the cloths were stored away over summer when a little bit of radiant heat loss is actually a really good thing. So if we look at a Saxon building and we imagine in all the elements it had originally it was probably pretty comfortable in both winter and summer. Then the Romans came and they were from a hot climate and they were used to having their building walls bare to keep cool. The only place they really warmed were their bathhouses so, and that was what the hypercourse were for. And when they got to Northern Europe, they kept building as if they were still in the med and they must have been just frozen. But of course they were great engineers and colonists who knew better than all those stupid local peasants. So they tried charcoal fires and they almost killed themselves. And then they tried building hypercourses in houses 
how much timber did they get through? And no surprise, when the empire fell, the local people just sensibly went back to doing what they'd always done, which worked. It wasn't that they didn't know any better. They did know better than the Romans how to live well in, in their local conditions. By the medieval period, the painted cloth makers, the painter stainers, and the upholders were two of the most powerful guilds, and wool cloths are probably not a small part of the reason that the wool and cloth trades were so important right across the world. It wasn't just clothes for the body. In Western Europe, we seem to have stopped using wool cloths really quite suddenly sometime in the late 17th or early 18th centuries. And I think this might have been because they were first stripped out during the plague, which was they knew was being spread by fleas and cloth. And then because we started heating with coal. So buildings suddenly were given lots of fireplaces and this time with comfort in mind. But of course, with all those flues everywhere, those Regency houses must have been seriously drafty. And I'm not surprised the Victorian put lots of these things back again to cope. The skirts on chairs weren't there because they were ashamed of seeing naked chair legs. They were there because they were trying to stop the drafts around their ankles. Mind you, the Victorians had already forgotten a lot about how pre-carbon buildings were meant to work. They did so much damage to comfort by stripping off the renders and plasters that kept the buildings dry and even pulled out ceilings so that you could look at all bits of ancient stone and roof timber that you were never meant to see, making all the buildings very cold and drafty. And dark too, because the whitewashed barrel vaulted ceilings really packed a punch. My boss sent me this photo. She thought that the lights were on in the chancel when she walked in, as you can see here, but it wasn't. It just reflected daylight. It's a reminder that a building envelope has to do certain things and it's no help to anyone to compromise that by a very antiquarian aesthetic vision. And that's something we need, might need to be sorting out about, uh, amongst ourselves. In the 20th century, in a fit of modernism, of course, and a wish for healthy colds and wiped down surfaces, we took all the Victorian stuff out again. So it's no wonder we have to keep throwing more and more energy at trying to be comfortable. And it's even more of a problem if we look at keeping cool, which is going to be the big issue with climate change. But researchers in the global south have done lots and lots of work on this to show how the vernacular handles this really well. It's a combination of thermal mass and radiant absorbing surfaces and cool drafts and solar shading and moving around the building according to the time of day. It's odd and a great shame that we don't yet have the equivalent of this research for um, the uh, cold climates to understand the traditional passive measures that people used. Um, I'm hoping that some people in the audience might be interested in taking this up. So hopefully we'll have some good da data and a better understanding soon. And we do need it to be soon now that we, as we keep changing our envelopes because we think the whole role is to keep it air trapped and it's not. There's one more important timeline in this history and it's those pesky building services, heating and lighting and plumbing and air conditioning. They're all driven by lots of energy and they come in incredibly late. And again, much more recently than most people realize. And the problem is they come in all at once in a big rush and as commercial initiatives. And that's meant they've introduced all sorts of new problems in and around buildings that we haven't resolved yet. We did not have rising damp before we put in water mains and sewers. And plumbing is by far the main culprit when it comes to damp in buildings. But we don't have the tight feedback loops that we had in the past where the people who made the materials and built with them were there on the spot to learn from what went wrong. So we've not had any sort thoughtful new aesthetics on this either in response. How can we be so mad as to embed plumbing right into the walls? So in some countries like Sweden, they do try and make a feature of the exposed pipe, but that's about it. These problems also fed into the development of the modernist aesthetic, unfortunately. And I love so many of these modern buildings. They're really interesting to work on, actually, but they embody so, so many issues from one-off materials and systems that fail to dependence on masses of operational in, uh, in, uh, energy. You know, I've heard modern buildings described as conduits for the surfaces. And, all the energy and carbon that that entails. And again, it all comes in so suddenly that unpicking just the past hundred years would take another whole lecture. So I won't do that to you, but I'll just leave you with a few final thoughts. First of all, 
how can we spread the word that traditional building detailing is absolutely related to function, however beautiful it is. Architects always quote form follows function, but if I'm going to be blunt, I've not seen that that's very true of many buildings of any period, architect design buildings of any period, isn't that controversial thing to say to you all? A parapet gutter is always an accident waiting to happen. But it's true of vernacular buildings. So can our professional training induce a deeper respect for these and start to pull in lessons from them? With the climate emergency, we'll need to do just that, not just to reduce the energy and carbon we're using, but also to make buildings that are more resilient to what's about to be thrown at them. It's time to get away from simple labels like traditional and modern, which really do stifle creative thought. The built environment should really be about understanding the needs of the people who are going to be using those buildings now and as far into the future as we can imagine. And then we need to pick the best tools to deliver the outcomes we want. Many of those will be all tried and tested tools, but some are going to be new ones, also tried and tested out in the field. Though. That's my only proviso. We need to think not just about the working properties of what we're using and what it looks like, but also how long it lasts and how we repair and maintain it. You know, when I see this sort of thing, I don't see energy saving. I see massive costs just waiting to happen in just a few years. And we need to get the message out to policymakers that you alter the original detailing at your peril, that all those hood mouldings and sills and eaves and cornices serve that practical purpose. And that when you're trying to do energy saving, you're not doing anyone any favours by getting rid of it. Then too, we need to prepare for a future that's going to look different to the past, even the well-established past. I was hearing just last week from an African colleague that the new rainfall patterns that are starting to erode their earthen buildings in a way they've never seen before. So they're working on increasing that protective uh, layer, the rain, the layer of, um, um, of lime perhaps, luckily still in a full understanding of how the whole system works in the first place. And that's my final thought, that whatever the noises that come out of the various COPs, it's actually the global south rather than the global north that's currently proving itself being able to think about this in the right way. So we need to be working closely with our colleagues there and learning from them and getting away from foisting global north NGO horror buildings on them in the name of modernity or leveling up. You know, we got a lot wrong in our headlong rush into and through the Industrial Revolution, and it's time to take pause and take better stock of that truth. And that's more than enough from me. So I'll stop sharing my screen. <laughs> wow, that was amazing. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> um, Mark, are you, are you there? Is Mark I am indeed. Yes. yes. Oh, hello, Mark. Yeah. How are you? I, um, oh, Robin, so great. You were, you were, all, you, you were just as wonderful as I thought you would be. <laughs> That's uh, very kind of you. Yeah. But it's yeah. a great subject. It's a great subject. It's hard to do a NAF talk on such a good subject. That's yeah. It. No. No. Well, I mean, you're, you're, you're. It was fantastic. I just, um, I'm sorry, I wasn't there to introduce you, um, because you're, you're quite a special case, um, and I was so keen that you gave a talk because. Um, first of all, you know, um, you're so expert, and I, I don't know if Simon mentioned that you were on this, uh, you know, the REF panel, uh, that's where we met just, just last year. So, um, you know, that's this sort of um, torture process by <laughs> the British government um, trying to get academics not to do what they're interested in, um, <laughs> but to sort of button down and um, do what the government wants. And so they, you know, you, you, you give people little marks and some brownie points and stuff. And so that's where I met Robin. So who's the, the true- The panel you know, was top, terrific, wasn't it? It was just it the was, most brilliant you know, set of people. Top, top of the discipline. And Robin was the one who kept us most amused. And <laughs> we uh, gave us a fantastic uh, tour of York. That was the um, the one physical. Oh, I, I think I, I hand over to my. I give the accolades to my colleague Giles on that. He's brilliant. Well, he he, he did, but then that was the cathedral, and then we actually went round with you in the town in the rain, and that Lovely. that was great. Anyway, so my my um, I mean I I'm very uh, happy in a sense because I've been uh, with um, Tag, keen to get some more let's say ac academics researchers. Um, involved in giving talks because I think it just sort of ups the level 
Um, and so, uh, Robin, we hope to carry on with, with more like you. And um, I think that's what we need to do. We need to basically clone you uh, <laughs> and, and send you around the world and send you around. Every architecture school should have a Robin. Um, and, well, and then they I think would... every architecture school needs the historians. That's what I think. Yes, is, but they me, it, just like every science faculty needs the historians. No, but you can have historians. I mean, I'm I'm suppose one of those, and of course there are my dear colleagues who are a little bit on the theoretical side, and they can get um, right up their own. <clears throat> um, sorry, and uh, you know, whereas you're, you know, everything keeping everything practical is um, is so is so great. Anyway, but I won't. I don't. I. Don't want to rub it on too much, but I did have um, one really small uh, little point um, about the Romans, and then I wanted to ask you a more general question, and, and then uh, after that, I'll shut up and let, let other people. Yeah, talk. I mean, I'm, I'm treading in dangerous area talking about history to you guys, so I'm bound to have got things wrong. But oh no, no, I wasn't thinking it was wrong. I was just uh, so interested when it got to the Roman bit about about lime and you were talking about actually how how much of lime would have been you made let's say cooked on the spot so to speak and yeah. then mixed on the spot whereas you know um i don't know if everyone's familiar with this sort of um maybe not completely um uh, let's say showing off unrealistic thing of vitruvius saying that you know the idea was to keep lime for 10 years and but i think there there are studies that show that it was really quite you know three year one to three years was fairly normal and mm. i was thinking oh how does this square with what you've just told us and i was well, thinking I, I was looking at the vitruvius translation and it's not it's fresco, clear it? yeah that it's no, but not i think that he's, it got translated as slaked but um nigel copsey and others are disputing that that's what he meant that's the trouble again he's using different words we but, translate but, them into a word we know and then right but on the other hand i think we do have things like lime pits and things so oh yes uh, we use we use lime for lots of things and whitewash is definitely uh, lime putter right. um it's interesting i've been working with a wonderful romanian builder and that's how they did it they always hot mixed but they always used right the well what I, what I was going to ask you was yeah would there be hot mixing for most building because you wouldn't need such refined lime in your walls well, but you would even, keep even, sorry, even for me, the wall paintings even for the frescoes it seems oh well, for the wall paintings but you sometimes use this really fine marble dust and oh, yeah. anyway that that was my question <laughs> was whether, whether the um, thing about the extra special long the long lived um, lime was mainly for the surface but if you're now saying you don't even need it for the surfaces then i'm lost um no that's right it's really interesting because everyone always has said oh well, the hot mixing well you probably wouldn't do it for for the 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 frescoes but you can see that that's exactly what Janino Janini is talking about it's exactly what he says and then um i had when I was doing my degree, we all did slaked lime, and I mixed a lot of slaked lime pluses in my time. And I mixed the Sistina one with lime dust. Oh my God, that was hard to do. And you know that that um, Michelangelo did all the lime himself for that ceiling, which I never thought I could never understand how he'd managed it. But as soon as you're hot mixing, it's fine. You know, right. it, it okay. really goes well. well but so that that no, that, I think that's one for the pub, isn't it? And you know what they'd often, you know, they didn't use it hot; they banked it, so they they covered it with earth or so, and it does get better, right? Over, right over time. I think it would be challenging without plastic buckets <laughs> to to keep it for ten years, as Vitruvius is saying. So it'd be interesting to see what he's really meaning. Right. But, um, anyway, but yeah, that's one we. Better. But on the general question, and this is a little bit pessimistic. Um, but the question is, you, 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 and I'm talking you plural, people like you, Historic England, you know, are learning all these things and coming up with this. And you're sort of, if you like, generating wisdom. You're sort of doing a retrofit wisdom I'm trying thing. to reinvent the wheel again and hoping we're not reinventing well, it square. Well, well, well the, the problem is, I, I see it, is the more you, all this wisdom that you're producing, the more you do it, the faster the contemporary architecture races off and ignores you. I mean, that's that's what <laughs> but I'm. That's the other advantage about the 
hot mixing. Because when once you've shown a builder hot mixing, suddenly a lot of their their dubiousness evaporates. <laughs> Right. And you know, quite right too. It's it's so much easier to do, but it gives a much better product. It's it's very much stickier. The 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 lime content is much higher, and so it's just inc it's really lovely to work with. So once they realised the next step was discovering that they didn't have to use it hot. <laughs> right. Well, you have in this audience, you have got people who will be, you know, specifying. Um, uh, you know, lime, and so well. My, who, let's see who's brave enough to um, specify hot lime. But, it's the prediction but, in in hot mixing, we call it. Be hot mixing. Um, hot mixing. Yeah, right. and here's a prediction: in ten years, we'll have forgotten that we ever did any with slaked. Oh, well, you think? Yeah, it's wow. going really fast. It's going really fast. Good, but uh, um, but Robin, how do we stop the madness of some of the the contemporary buildings? that are ignoring everything you're saying? I think this is to do with why buildings are constructed these days, which is, you know, if you think about the buildings in the city of London where the turnover is, what, 12 to 16 years, it's not about yep. the building that you use. The buildings are, have hardly any time in use and often they're almost empty. It's about a building as a, as a way of parking or laundering money. And it's when it, it's going to have to stop because the energy is just not going to be there available again. It's going to go back to being as expensive and difficult as it ever was. It's already doing that. And that will make people stop. It's a pity that we come to it so late because actually, you know, like all things, if you do it well and keep it longer, it's much more agreeable. Oh, what is what other questions? Linseed yes. oil paints. Let's, 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 who's who's got a question? Um, There's the linseed oil paint. They're terrific. Those like the Swedish linseed oils. They're really, really, really good. Um, again, my Rubadian builder is a great believer in them. And when we were trying to work out what we should recommend for windows, and so I did the the ultimate research tool. You go online and you look at the builders' blogs, where builders on Reddit and so are talking to each other. And those are the ones that they're saying, you know, we go back after 10, we go back after seven years we, to refresh. It doesn't need refresh and go after 10, back after 10 years. It still looks great. So the linseed oils are really, really <coughs> good paints. What's the other one? <laughs> ah, yes, the damp. If you want to, on, on Historic England, uh, on the website, on Technical Tuesday's website, if you go into previous webinars, just about the very first ones, they're a few years old now, but a, a, a common sense damp. So I go into the science of that more deeply if you're interested. Mm, uh, yes. Yeah. Um, different matting down and yet yeah it's exactly so it's so more on the linseed oil and absolutely right that's that we see and it does it, you know the thing will be when we have the confidence not to run back run to every shiny new toy but rather keep saying this works and therefore we'll use that yeah. As I said, you know, trying to fix the modern buildings with the shiny new toys, that's a real interesting challenge, you know, <laughs> when it comes to challenging conservation, that's really interesting and fun, but boy, is it difficult. So it always annoys me when they refer to the older buildings as hard to treat. And they, Since who? Yes. yes, Robin, what would be your, the most difficult building you've come across? I mean... Lloyd's. Lloyd's, right. Mm. I often put the Lloyd's two grade one listed. I often start my talks with a slide with two grade one listed buildings in London next to each other. And I say, which one keeps me awake at night? St. Paul's or Lloyd's? Here's the clue yes. it isn't St. Paul's. I am. Um, yes. Hello, sorry, can I make a, one or two points, if I may? Sorry. Off you go, Bob. Off you go, yes. Uh, they're all slightly random um, and <laughs> rather different. Um, um, Origins of glass. I don't know if you're aware. Mm. In, in Egypt, there are areas where there is a high concentration of iron ore immediately below the sand, and the lightning strikes it, and it makes natural tubes of glass. Oh uh, no, I did not know that. Now that is interesting. Uh, I mean, I've, I've, I don't know if I, uh, I won't go to where I came across this, but it's quite a random thing that I 
I came across, and um, I had some someone who had a collection of these these sort of bumpy tubes of glass, which were naturally made by lightning striking sand. So that was one one random point. Um, um, the other one was, of course, you, you talk about cloth, but you also um, the thing one notices about old pictures, um, particularly in winter, is just how much clothing people wore, um, and they even wore hats inside, and and um, even, even in the 19th century, a, a frock coat um, was quilted, and people wore quilted waistcoats. I mean, Absolutely. they picked more outdoor in, outdoor things. We would call outdoor things inside. That's right, and they're apparently really good. I I, I heard that um, there's some people have been doing experiments on this, and they said that actually one of the best things are those hats that you know the whole bind type hats. Yes, yeah. They're amazing. They're just and so good. The, 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 third, the, the, the third random point was a, a, a issue which I've observed many times is parapet gables, um, which are used most frequently in places where the wind is strongest. Because if you ever look at a, a, a after a storm, the thing that goes first is the stripping the, the uh, tiles off the gable. Um, mm -hmm. And even in places like Jersey, where you don't think they have them, they do actually have them, thing called a very, very small one. And my final point, a rather random point, is 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 picking up the Lloyd's issue, or for that matter, the the uh, the um, how how long buildings last. One of the culprits in this is the way the buildings are financed. Is that after yeah. ten after ten years, um, the the people who finance the building is off their books. They don't do calculations beyond that. Yeah. So they actually and have that's... no they have no interest uh, in in the longevity of the building when they actually work out the financial formula. Um, for funding the building, uh, and that's a, a major culprit in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, I have heard it suggested they have reverse taxation. In other words, you you tax a you, you tax a building less the older it is. Uh, but so that, that, so that, sorry, those are those instead are, you pay fifty you pay full VAT twenty yeah, percent to yeah. do repair and maintenance. But yeah. if you trash the whole thing as long as you pull up all the concrete foundations, you pay zero. It's a taxation system is completely the wrong way around, but I mean, it, it will be. So, so there's a series of random points. So uh, brilliant talk. Thank you very much. Oh, that's a, can I show you, I'll just share my screen again to show you one thing that I thought was really interesting in that. Is that going to go through? When you have a look at the, um, this is clearly in winter, the picture in the center. I love this one. Uh, and cause he's wearing, he's got his fur hat there. But what is really interesting, you know, there's a little bit of glass at the top, but that window is open. So they, by the combination of what they're doing, the clothes and the, the, the wall cloths, they actually can have a substantial fresh air, you know, really opening the windows. And one of the striking things when you read uh, texts and so is they all talk about how much they like the ventilation for health and so as well and that's something that kind of puzzles us now but if if they're getting if they're dealing with most of their thermal discomfort not by trying to do things with the air temperature then maybe you can get away with this and this is something that we want to investigate further the trouble is we don't know quite how to measure it. No thermal physiologist does. And it's that thing again, the things that are most useful are the hardest to measure. I think the other issue is, is that longevity is, is not subject to any uh, agreed system of measurement. Um, and longevity is the elephant in the room when it comes to sustainability. Mm -hmm. And whereas you can measure heat loss and you can measure all those things, but longevity has no universal metric. So it simply doesn't really enter effectively into the discussion. Yeah, and that's right. You know, there's a huge, you have to be blunt and say there is a huge industry in HVAC in particular that mm. has built up. And there are some, there are some brilliant um, engineers who are worried about this and have been for years and have been trying to say, look, it's about radiant and the, 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 the maths that we use does not cover it because it doesn't understand it. Um, so, you know, all those calculations really miss the point. In a sense, those calculations are trying to say that what you ideally want is no heat loss into walls, which is untrue for a start because then you would die. And then the best way of, of getting the wall up to the same temperature as body temperature so that you don't have any heat transfer is to use the air to heat the wall. Now, there's, that couldn't be more inefficient. And actually, it's very different to that. And so 
what would just be nice is to do some tests about what actually works and in one sense it's really easy because we're all sensors we could all do it and I'm indeed you know I've got stuff on my walls and I can say it really does work uh, even a net curtain across a window you know you feel if you pull the curtain back you can feel how cold it is and you pull the net across and you get an enormous difference so we can all feel that but it's this mad world we live in we want to put numbers on things yeah, there's, <laughs> it's a whole, hard to number on. there's a whole system and the whole issue uh, uh, a whole thesis on how systems of measurement influence what we do i mean in a whole range of ways this is just one of them but building yeah. fin building finance uh, and, and the way people measure it is, is another one yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm a physicist, but I have therefore a healthy disrespect for numbers because I know that they're always a simplification. Same with models, you know, I, don't get me started on the building models. Buildings are just too complex. It would take you decades to build. It, it's more complex than the weather models to build a single building model that of an occupied building. And then you do it one, then you change one thing change the windows and you have to start again and you think well why we can just go out and have a look <laughs> yes robin um if if people like you researched we we, we would um well you obviously are we we cut 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 through all of this all, all the crap um i try to yes <laughs> it's Excellent. quite handy sometimes to say you know i am a physicist but it helps to put the engineers back into a box <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, I mean, I could listen all evening, but there may be people who want to wind up and get away. There's a couple uh, uh, more comments and questions, actually. Yeah. Robin, do you want to um, yeah. look at those? Yeah, do you want to read them out? You want yeah, to ask so them the first one's uh, about how building regulations effectively mm -hmm. prohibiting natural building techniques. Mm -hmm. Longevity is virtually made illegal. Fixation on mm. CO2 pushes forward things like double glazing last 25 years. I mean, the air tightness as well, I'll throw in there. We're obsessed now about making our buildings as airtight as possible and then well, having yeah. to use mechanical ventilation to kind of stop you again from dying and becoming so unhealthy. That Absolutely. You, you know, and all this stuff about fuel poverty, because fuel poverty can be really related to damp, basically. What What's happening is these people live in substandard. Um, you know, substandard maintenance, even more than the buildings, the buildings, some of them might be really difficult, but probably most of them with a bit of maintenance could be fine, but they're just badly maintained, you know, when we were looking at, uh, the, it did a big research project called Damp Towers, where they um, looked at um, what, how, um, rendering for very, 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 very damp church towers, and one of the examples exemplars that they had I think it was Chalicum or something like that and um, when they had originally been going to visit you know and there were ferns growing on the inside of the, the church tower and it was so cold even in summer they just couldn't bear it it was just unbelievable then they put the render on and they went back a couple five years or something later to to see how it was going and it happened to be in winter and it was snowy outside and they sat inside for the meeting and they were really comfortable and it was only at the end when they'd been there a few hours that they said we didn't put the heating on you know it if if you're damp you feel hotter when it's hot and you feel colder when it's cold you really it damp is terrible and then you get all the ancillary things of mold and so and all that is <coughs> jury out about how much actual physical damage to do, that does to people it does awful damage to them psychologically as well and you know so when when they say that to solve fuel poverty we have to trap more water in the buildings i could just cry so i'm determined to try and get people thinking more about what it is they're actually trying to do got a question about um yeah um hotline yeah. and so howard's asking um is he right in thinking it's quick line plus sound how do you obtain transport and safety use such a caustic material well the, the powder lime isn't as long as it's dry, it's not caustic at all. You just got to keep it dry. <laughs> so don't put it somewhere it's going to get rained on. You're going to have a really interesting event. <laughs> but um, but while it's a powder, it's it, it's inert. So um, so you just get everything ready and then you you mix it with um, shovels and sticks. It's, it's actually it's not that bad. 
you know you can mix it in buckets and so and it's um it's fine it's actually much you know if you've ever tried using lime and cement it, one it's the cement that feels really caustic and uh actually this is really quite easy and you don't muck around with it so much either you know because you just with a shovel you know you shovel out the three is to one you sprinkle it with a bit of water and you push it all into the middle, sprinkle it with a bit of water, push it all into the middle and then you just leave it for a bit. And again, the longer you leave it, the more it takes, slakes the well within. But there's something that's going on about the, the slaking process that seems to make a better mortar as well. But that one, we're still trying to understand. That's that's a bit anecdotal, whether the, Robert, the end Robin. result is. Can I just ask though that, you know, it said the longer you're saying, you know, the better it gets, but you're talking about very short periods of time. You're talking about what, half an hour or an hour or three hours or something. No, you're no, no. You generally you <clears throat> leave it for a couple of days. Just a couple of days. Yes, that's that's. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's why I said I'm not quite sure. I can well imagine if you can put it in a bucket, it's it, unless you've got hair in it or something, because the hair will just be destroyed then. But if you've got it in a, a, a if you could put it in a bucket, you can keep it for a long time. But generally on old sites, they just banked it. They they put it aside and put earth over it so it didn't uh, carbonate. Well, I think, well, that's what I was always assuming. That's what a lime pit is. But I think we have to have a proper, we have to go and have a, um, you know, a drink of this one. I <laughs> <laughs> can I make a point about that? That, that yeah. um, uh, with hot lime, and I've worked with Nigel Copsey a lot. On oh, yay, yeah, yeah, Nigel but, is, um, Nigel can. Because <laughs> uh, I'm, in, I'm in York. Um, he no, uses no. it straight away. You know, I've seen him do this on buildings. He, he, he will just mix it and use it. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah I mean, he, he doesn't Gerard paint Lynch. it. No, I mean, he, Lynch. he may have some in his, in his you know, garage banks, but in general, he can you can use it straight away. And he's used he that can. on churches in York on, on that way. That's right. And he's written some very interesting things about using hot lime wash that seems to take very well. But in general, you know, Gerard Lynch, who comes from a long line of mortar, you know, because they used to have master mortar masters as well as mortar mason, master masons. And he said in general they'd bank it for three or four days and it was interesting that my Romanian builders were doing that they would mixed it on the Friday for using on the Monday well, I've got a question from Jana saying could you recommend any good books on energy saving techniques architecture based on traditional building construction practice they're uh, mostly modern wisdom of energy efficiency or passive air strategies but uh, yeah um they really I mean, are i think we need to write one don't we uh, well, there are some say, you, you there's some good, <laughs> there's some good book, people like sandy um, and so sandy holiday is, yeah, exactly. you know there, there's some really good stuff but i think we need to um we need to perhaps broaden out what we mean i think what i generally miss is the people element in all books all books about buildings that really your definition of whether a building is working is whether it's working for the uses that you need it to be uh, uh, robin the other the other thing i think we need to join if you if you aren't already um you know having good conversations with people in policy you did put that word up earlier you know uh, i mean i think that's what it really um would be the sort of biggest sin single contribution because if you like someone like yourself can talk to people like this audience and enthusiasts and people who are kind of really are patient and study and they do care about the feedback loop and all of that and then there's the lobbies and the finance we've been talking about the politicians and the building regulator and all of that it's a vast machine uh, yeah. and actually it's how to get to um policy and um perhaps perhaps over the next sort of couple of weeks we could um we, we could get together some ideas for you of maybe people you could always you could useful get. and the, the team i'm in my boss Marwena slade is terrific at getting to policymakers. so i had a a joint 
talk last week with um, the head of architecture in uh, the Department of Education, who's just fantastic. And also uh, one of the very important people with buildings in the home office. And we were all absolutely seeing eye to eye. So I think right. it really is a change. It feels like there's a change. And um, what we were talking about this, that we feel in before lockdown, when you talked about comfort, you got really blank looks you don't now and I think it's because in the past your 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 building approach you went home and you just crashed then you went to work and you know the the facilities managers set it up and nobody was particularly happy but you didn't think about it. that was just what it was you know so yeah but now when you sit at home as you're sitting there you think Whatever the thermostat says, I feel cold because I've got this draft coming down my back. Where's that coming from? And you trace it back and you do something about it. And people has people spent you know two years essentially doing that. And it has changed the landscape completely. It's really interesting. Absolutely. Mm. So <sighs> anyone else? Like all we have to do is change the world. Yes, quite, quite. As Carl Elefante said, if not us, who? You know, I think one of the, to me, one of the most worrying things was hearing Nora Stura from UNEP, who coordinates the one buildings group of the UN Environment Programme, saying that trying to get them, anyone in the policy making on climate interested in buildings is really hard. And you go, well, for heaven's sake, every single thing we do is in and around buildings and the built environment. This is what it is. It, 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 you know, there isn't anything without that. So how can they possibly be sidelining it? So there's the, the audience, probably the target audience isn't even within the building sphere. It's actually yeah. beyond that. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> well. So I think, Robin, we ought, we ought to probably let you um, rest up after that uh, wonderful, uh, well, you know, really quite exciting, uh, gripping. Oh, yes. No, I well, I mean, I'm pretty sure everyone, well, everyone uh, who, who's uh, most people have hung on to the bitter end, so to speak. <laughs> well, I'll let them all go and have dinner as well. <laughs> yes. I, I just think we need we need a bit more of this. And I'll be, you know, I'll be very interested, actually, to... Um, uh, people in the audience and any emails to us uh, to the committee um, just to you know any any um, if there's a feeling to get more let's say historians uh, involved although you're you're a building physicist yourself but I, I yeah, yeah. yeah you're a I'm a historian okay. really okay. you're but like quite a few people you can be two things at one time well I'm a, a magpie I know good historians and I know who yes, to ask but, that's yeah, the thing yeah <laughs> that's that's right. Yes. So, well, um, Robin, that was that was fantastic, um, and we were really, really, um, really. Um, Thank you privileged. very much for asking me. So go off and fight the fight. Right. That's what well, we come, do. That's... Come, come and come and and do some of this this work that I wish someone would do about the passive for um, for cold climates. Really, really yes. needed. Yes. It's it's really difficult. I mean, whenever you you try i mean there are people here who built houses uh recently and there's um things like um well you know trying to use traditional techniques to actually get um, um energy performance that will pass and but again maybe... we're, it, we're forgetting where the energy is going the energy is mostly going and trying to condition the air so if we get away from conditioning the yes, air, we yeah. solve 90 percent of our problem so it is how what did they do in the past when they didn't condition the air? Right. Well, on that note, yes, I'm afraid. Air, I mean, I'm doing the, this huge project with massive air conditioning, and most of the time I think you don't need it, you don't need it, you don't need it, you don't need it. But do you realize that 21% of the yearly increase in energy use in the world is due to air conditioning yeah. uptake? So and, it, and it's going to get worse and it's, it's like exponential yeah. because the hotter it gets yeah. the more you then need your air conditioning and then all the cities they're pumping out hot air into the street and you've got cement and asphalt and all of that and all of these boxes it's hope yeah it's it's going to become yeah. it, it really yeah hard. we have to derail it we have to 
So we have yeah. to show other ways of doing things. Right. On that note, Robin, thank you so much again. Thank you, guys. Thank you yeah. very much. Thanks very much.